Today we're going to kick things off with somebody I know you know. In regards to Milwaukee television news, for years she was a favorite as a reporter and anchor, as well as the uh, first female news director of a major market television station. And along with that, she is now moved into the field of uh, being an influencer of leaders. And, and what, the, what the story is, she's got a book out right now called Work Happy, What Great Bosses Know. And the book basically in her words, is about extraordinary leaders. It's for extraordinary leaders and productive, happy workplaces. Uh, We speak of the former reporter, anchor, and news director of WITI, what was then TV6, now Fox 6, and today she is uh, the head of the leadership and management programs of the Pointer Institute. We are happy to welcome Jill Geisler to our program. Jill, welcome to the show. We appreciate you being with us. Great to be with you, Ted. Okay, for those who don't know what the Pointer Institute is all about, (laughs) and I'm sure there are a few. It is a nonprofit school for journalists and media leaders that's in St. Petersburg, Florida. I still live in Wisconsin. I commute there <laughs> to teach, and I have done that since 1998, to teach seminars for leaders in, in media from around the world. So and I, I take it you're pretty much in constant contact with the folks down in Florida, right? Oh, yes. Are we- I, either I'm there, or I'm there virtually, or I'm on the road for them. I do an awful lot of teaching in organizations. For example, I'll be spending two days at NPR in Washington, D.C., teaching oh. next week. Mm-hmm. Also at newspapers and at, uh, for the Associated Press. And then we also conduct seminars there. And my focus is on leadership. Mm-hmm. But I also have expanded beyond just media with the new book into leaders in every industry. Right, and that's what I was going to bring up, because you're you're in an organization that's based in journalism leadership, but this book can deal with leaders in any way, shape, or form, frankly. Well, here's what's interesting. Um, The columns that I wrote for the Institute's website began to get circulated, and we developed a podcast two Mm -hmm. years ago that was placed on iTunes U, and they're free, and they're three- to five-minute lessons on leadership. And we didn't focus them on journalism. We focused them on things managers needed to know, things they struggled with, because so many managers don't get training. Well, it turns out Apple reported to us that we've had between 7 and 8 million downloads of these of these podcasts in this library, and that kind of got the attention of publishers who said, sounds like you could take that material and put that into a book, and so I spent a good amount of time writing, and just a few weeks ago, the book was published. Well, that's great news, because altogether, leadership is not an easy thing, and I th- <laughs> I'm sure, you know, you hear from plenty of people in regards to, you know, I'm sure you get questions left and right when it comes to what's the right thing to say, what's the right thing to do, and and I guess the the book Work Happy, What Great Bosses Know is a nice starting point to finding out how how to answer those questions. Oh, absolutely. A lot of people are really good at doing something and so you get promoted to being a manager and then you find out that you need an entirely different set of skills. It's what happened to me. I always say I teach from my mistakes. What made you successful as an individual performer does not necessarily make you successful as a person who's now responsible for everybody's success. And so what I tried to do was not only teach from my mistakes, but over the course of my own career and then joining the Pointer Institute, I also acquired a master's degree in in leadership and management studies. And so I take experience that's very practical, research that backs it up, and turn it into real direct tips for people. So the book is actually kind of a workshop and a book for anybody who wants to be a great boss or work for a great boss. Or they want to be a great boss is a great place to start out, that's for certain. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so so altogether, I know that you have a number of different points when it comes to this book here. Just, you know, little uh, little ideas along the way. I just want to bring up one that I've found here. Uh, how mm-hmm. managers can defeat their evil twins. <laughs> what's, that, what's that all about, Jill? Well, one of the things I, I should explain that in the seminars that I teach, all of the managers who come are required to get 360 degree feedback from the people who work for them, from other managers, from their own bosses. And as a result of that, I have read thousands of reports on managers. And one of the things that I have discovered is that most bosses don't come to work each day thinking, how am I going to make your job hell? But whether they try to or not, they may, even with the best of intentions, do things that cause people to be very unhappy. 
And I call that their evil twin syndrome. So, for example, you could be a manager who says, you know what? I want to be the kind of boss who would never ask somebody to do something I wouldn't do. So I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get right in there and help people. Now, that's what you've got in your mind. And that's why you reach in and you oftentimes join in the work that they're doing or redo some of the work they're doing. Well, guess what? Your evil twin may be seen by the group, and that's called the micromanager. You're thinking one thing. People are seeing something else entirely. You may see yourself as a person with exceptionally high standards. So you're saying, I'm the person who always sets the bar high. But your evil twin is the boss who's impossible to please. And the problem is, unless you talk to people about what your intentions are, explain why you're doing what you're doing, and some bosses don't think they owe people an explanation. Well, interestingly enough, when you explain the reasons behind what you do, and when people truly believe and can see that they're positive, it can change the frame. Because there are bosses who roll up their sleeves and help and they get great credit, and there are bosses who roll up their sleeves and are seen as micromanagers. And I think that feeds into another point that you have here, simply because, you know, people are different, their motivations are different, their their energy level is different, and that is why you shouldn't treat everyone the same. <laughs> Exactly. You know, there is a sort of a, a, a thought that out of fairness, I should treat everyone the same. Well, I don't think that you should have different values for people, but you need to recognize that your approach for each person, you're like the conductor of a symphony. You don't necessarily play every instrument, but every instrument is different, and you have to know how to get the best out of each one. So if you have a person, for example, who's extroverted, who loves to talk through ideas, who loves, who really loves, gets their energy energy from conversation and connections, that person is going to deal, you're going to deal with that person differently than the introvert who really likes quiet time to think and formulate an idea before bringing it forward. And so what happens often is that whatever you are and you like as a boss, if you like public praise, you know, you can't imagine somebody not liking public praise. So you drag somebody forward in front of the group and say, let's hear it for Ted. And it turns out that Ted is a person who would have much preferred just a little note from you. But you were treating Ted the way you wanted to be treated, and it turns out that the golden rule in this case isn't enough. You've got to take it one step higher. Treat people the way they'd like to be treated, the things that motivate them, how they communicate. And that takes extra effort on the part of the boss. I was just going to say that. Sometimes you have to do a little research. You have to do a little observation when it comes to that because it's not always evident. Well, and, and I think many times, um, you know, we, we think that everyone has to conform to the boss. Mm -hmm. Well, as bosses, we set all kinds of expectations. We control people's wages, hours, working conditions. It's not a democracy, and people don't all get to vote on how things are going to be. Make no mistake about it, you are an authority figure as a boss, and you can't be too nice to have a tough conversation. But if you've established your credibility every day by, ha by treating people with the understanding of what motivates them and what really matters to them, well, when you have to have those tough conversations, they're going to be a lot easier. Yeah. Now, one thing you mentioned in regards to the seminars that you conduct, it, it has to do with the fact that the, uh, the bosses, the leaders you have in there, they end up having to get 360 feedback. <laughs> yes. now, now, I yes. take it that's good, bad, and ugly. And now, it's got to be kind of difficult for uh, these leaders to, for one thing, draw out this criticism, mm -hmm. you know, good and bad from their employees, as well as be able to accept it. Well, what's interesting is that a lot of people don't know how to really give feedback to the boss. You know, if you say something positive to the boss, it might sound like you're sucking up. Mm -hmm. And if you say something negative, you might be risking your job. So they quietly go along with thinking good thoughts and negative thoughts and only on rare occasions have an opportunity to really have that kind of a conversation. So I, you know, the, the, in my teaching, I provide that conversation in a safe way. And what happens is really interesting. First of all, bosses learn how, how, how much they are on display. They're like a walking billboard. I'll often ask a, boss, a group of bosses, tell me about a rule you never knew you made. 
and they'll all laugh and say, oh my gosh, you know, I can remember one time I was sitting and looking at a report, or I was looking at uh, some project that we were working on, and I said, I don't know if I like that color blue. And the next thing you know, everybody says, there's a rule, we can't use blue. Well, that's not what the person said, but they have such, um, they have a megaphone that they don't know they have. Mm -hmm. But they also find out in the feedback that things that they had done didn't go unnoticed. The person who said, you know what, I know your grandmother meant a lot to you. Go, 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 go to the hospital now. We'll cover for you. They'll remember that for years to come. And it shows up in this feedback. It also shows up when people are cold or unfeeling or probably one of the worst things of all is when a boss doesn't give sufficient credit to people for the good they do, and worse than that, takes credit for their work. Well, that's the thing, because I know there are plenty of situations, you know, when it comes to employer-employee relations, where the workers get no feedback whatsoever, and that's probably the worst situation, because you don't know whether you're doing a good job, or you don't know if you're doing a bad job, so therefore, you're just kind of like, you know, in limbo, more or less. Oh, absolutely, and that really is the case. In the feedback that I see, even when bosses are told they are good at giving people feedback. People still want more. There are bosses today who still say, if you don't hear from me, assume you're doing a good job. Well, that's really saying, I'm going to neglect you and I want you to think it's okay. And it's not okay. And interestingly enough, the youngest employees that we have today, the millennial generation, the Gen Y as they're called, are people who, because of, because of technology, have been able to get answers and information faster than ever before. They can, they can go online and check how their grades, what their grade status is in high school. They can text their parents. They, they have constant information available to them. They don't have to wait. And they're working for people who came from a time when information passed a little more slowly. So the boss thinks the young person is just being impatient. Tell me where I stand. Tell me how I'm doing. When, in fact, that person wants the same kind of feedback we all wanted as employees. They're just asking for it more than others because they've been accustomed to receiving it, and it seems so unusual not to get it.